Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming today to learn a bit about how the field of AI has been evolving and how some of the new, new AI tools that can be used to improve workflows for professional staff. Our organizations are here because we recognize that AI has enormous potential to transform the nature of the work that you all do as professional staff, for better or for worse. So we, the Potbox Foundation, um, Demand Progress, Indie Network, and the House Digital Service came together to kick off a series of discussions related to how AI can be used, uh, what to look out for, and chat through topics like privacy implications and much more. So this briefing is particularly, is very high level, this one that we're in right now, um, and we're going to just like at a very high level look at where Congress is today um, in its adoption of AI and give a very brief overview of what tools are available to staffers, and then we'll give concrete examples of where it can be most useful. Uh, and then we'll open up the floor to questions to the different speakers that you'll hear from, hear from shortly. Uh, because this is only an hour-long high-level discussion, that likely will be the first of many. We will be sending a follow-up survey after this, where you can pretty much put your interest topics that you hear. If there's something that's really interesting to you during this discussion, just jot it down, and then you can put it in the follow-up survey after. Um, so yeah, let's kind of get into it. We'll introduce the speakers now. So first off, we have Marcy Harris, who is a former staffer, lawyer, CEO, co-founder of Popbox.com and Popbox Foundation, which is a nonpartisan um, effort that supports innovation in government and civic engagement. She will be speaking on Congress and emerging technology. After that, we'll have Ken Ward, who's the director of the House Digital Service. The House Digital Service partners with House members, committees, and staff in solving tech problems in the legislative process. He'll be speaking about House Digital Service and their AI working group. Uh, after that, we have Lars Schoenander, who is a policy technologist at Lincoln Network, which is a nonprofit founded in 2014 with the mission of helping bridge Silicon Valley and DC. Uh, and he'll be speaking on recent developments in AI models. After that, we'll have Daniel Schumann, who's the policy director at Demand Progress Education Fund, uh, which is a nonprofit focused on building a stronger Congress and a more accountable government. He also co-leads the Congressional Data Coalition and runs an incredible newsletter that you should all subscribe to called the First Branch Forecast. Uh, he'll be speaking about using ChatGPT for congressional work. And then we have Ann Meeker, uh, who is a former district staffer, a casework expert, and deputy director at the Cockbox Foundation. She will be speaking on AI and casework. Uh, and then finally, we have myself, who is the moderator of this afternoon's discussion. I am a former tech policy staffer for Speaker Pelosi, uh, and previously an engineer, and I'm currently a senior advisor at Popbox Foundation. Uh, so thank you all to the organizations that we're collaborating with, Lincoln Network, Demand Progress, and House Social Service for coming together and being a resource to all who are here today. And yeah, we can kind of kick it off. So Marcy Harris. Great, thank you. Awesome, thanks so much for being here, you guys. Uh, just a quick, why in the world are we three organizations coming together to do this? Uh, we are always coming together to talk about the way that Congress uses technology, modernizes, processes, and supporting staff. Lincoln's a little bit on the right, Demand's a little bit on the left, we're right in the middle, and we are constantly collaborating to cheer for uh, the innovations that are happening, sometimes push a little bit, but uh, to try to uh, bring together resources and people and ideas uh, because we love this institution and we just can't quit it. Uh, so one of the ways that we frame uh, the kind of con Congress versus technology uh, uh, question is uh, that it is in fact the case that technology uh, grows, expands, develops very quickly, in some cases exponentially. That's the up and to the right chart that we're always used to seeing, the Moore's Law uh, question. And policy, by its nature, moves more slowly. Congress, by its nature, moves more slowly. Uh, but given that exponential curve, that can mean that the difference between the way technology is used in society is the gap grows every year between the external use and the internal use. Uh, we're not talking today about how Congress understands or regulates AI. Uh, we're not even talking about one of my favorite topics, which is how Congress compares to the executive branch and uses technology and resources itself to carry out its Article I functions. We're talking about the internal facing problem, which is can you 
keep up, are you able to use modern tools and processes for your work in ways that are similar to uh, the ways that uh, other industries are going to be using these new technologies. And I just want to acknowledge that Congress has been working on this. We are not in the same place where we were 10 years ago. Uh, a lot has happened. A lot of innovation has happened. Congress is ready for this, y'all. Uh, and a lot of that uh, has happened through efforts that you may have heard about or you may not have heard about. So I'm going through the laundry list because I want this to be part of this conversation. As you may know, in 2019, the House impaneled a select committee on the modernization of Congress that became a focus area for new ideas and bringing people together and talking about how to improve little process things, big technological things, even rules and other practices. And that has been really important. They produced 202 recommendations. And now we have a new, official, real-life subcommittee under the Committee on House Administration that is continuing this work. So the implementation of those recommendations continues. Uh, over the years, there have been bicameral congressional data task force that continues to meet. Uh, some of you younger folks may not realize how difficult it used to be to get that open data from congress.gov and other legislative sources. Uh, I'll skip down through just some of the innovations that took place during COVID, Congress rose to the challenge. Uh, I know there may be some interns here who have not experienced the uh, interesting, exciting work of walking from office to office to get signatures, because that's not necessary anymore. Thank you, Senate, that developed Quill and actually shared with the House and House Digital Services implemented Quill so that we have an e-signature platform. Uh, ongoing upgrades to congress.gov, the growth of the GAO, Science, Technology, Assessment, and Analytics Office, House and Senate have stood up AI caucuses, they're looking into the policy side of things, and then of course the launch up and staffing of House Digital Services, which is our uh, collaborative partner for this conversation. Uh, just want to flag, of those 202 recommendations that came out from the House Select Committee on Modernization, one of them mentioned artificial intelligence. None of them mentioned large language models. And that is really just a testament to the fact that modernization is not a destination. You don't get there and declare yourself modern. Congress is going to have to keep moving, keep paying attention, keep improving its processes, keep investing in staff, keep investing in technology in order to continue to try to close that pacing gap. Uh, so we think that today we're talking about the very, very baby entry point of how these new tools will be used in Congress. Some of you are probably already playing around drafting speeches or letters or other, uh, using it for other tools, and we'll talk a bit about those use cases today. Uh, we know that the world is going to change quite a bit uh, as these new tools become part of workplaces, not just here, but um, around the world. Uh, but you got to start somewhere, and so this, this conversation is a starting point with a massive asterisk that I think others will emphasize today, that currently these tools are not approved for use by the House or the Senate. They are under review, proceeded to your own risk, watch the private data, personal data, member data, et cetera, and be careful, but we're all gonna learn together. And so with that, I am going to pass it over to the board of House Digital Services. Thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, welcome. It's awesome to have everybody here today. My name is Ken Ward. I'm the director of our new House Digital Service. It's a totally new team here in the House, so I'm just going to take a moment uh, to share a little bit about it. We are a recommendation of the uh, modernization committee, and what we're trying to do is bring in um, some new methodologies to help innovate and, and adopt new technologies uh, here in the House. So um, we're all about experimenting and iterating and trying new things. Uh, and working alongside you, all of our customers, to uncover the pains and challenges, and really work alongside of you uh, to prototype and deliver new products and services. Um, you know, our team is composed of product managers, user experience designers, software engineers. And what this means is we have a cross-functional team that can do a lot of things. You know, we brought Quill in and, and, and rolled that out here in the house. <laughs> We've um, procured other softwares, for example. Um, a voting app that was used by the Democrat caucus to do the transition. Um, and we can build things too. We recently launched a PDP input tool that's helping 
committee staff to see one another's future plans uh, as a first step to help uh, deep conflicting. So we can buy stuff, we can build stuff, but we're all about like rapidly bringing new technologies to bear. And so this uh, working group is very exciting for us. Uh, we have a broad advisory group that we depend on to understand what we should be working on, and then when we start working on things, how to solve these particular problems. So, you know, with the, with the committee team, we've been working very, very closely with the committee clerks. Uh, but this working group, uh, our, our broad advisory group is open to everyone. You can go to digitalservice.house.gov to sign up. And this AI working group is a subset of that. So uh, this is really exciting. This is a, a really kind of uh, uh, early, early adoption of this, so to speak. We want to understand how these tools can help you every day and how you do your regular jobs. And then figure out how to then uh, perhaps personalize them and make them uh, bespoke here for Congress. So this working group was announced. We already have a ton of signups. We have a budget to get out 40 of these chat GPT plus licenses. We already had over 100 folks subscribe. But please feel free to continue to sign up and participate. Even if we're unable to give you a license to try, there are free versions of these tools. Um, you know, not just ChatGPT, there's Google Bard and there's others coming online. But the point of this is to allow you guys to experiment and then give us feedback so we can understand what it is that you're uh, leveraging these tools to do, what's working and what's not working. So uh, while our broad advisory team, we work very, very transparently in hospital digital service, this is a little unique because it's kind of new. We're saying this is going to be um, uh, private and anonymous. So you're going to give this feedback to us. We're going to compile that and share it back out uh, all the way up to the speaker so everybody can kind of understand the opportunities that are there with these tools. Uh, so again, really unique, uh, but please feel free to sign up um, and, and participate in this. And you know, this is the first and hopefully a bunch of events to bring experts in to understand um, the possibilities. Now this is all new. These, you're going to hear language thing here, large language models. What is this stuff? Artificial intelligence is a big, broad term. But uh, similar to how you know, search engines scrape the internet, these large language models are digesting information and then regurgitating it to it. So it's worth knowing, hey, if I put information into the system, it kind of becomes part of that system. So there's some things to be, be careful of. If you go to uh, digitalservice.house.gov slash AI, uh, we have some, some things there to think about. Some of the ethics, some of the perhaps biases involved with these models, uh, some of the cyber concerns. And one thing in particular that we've seen to be aware of is you know, if you go right to OpenAI and ChatGPT, GPT, that's great. But there are some folks that are repackaging this into an app as an intermediary, and that's a dangerous thing, right? So if there's some other person involved or some other entity involved, that's definitely something to be careful of. Um, the working group, uh, future possibilities, and we're going to hear from a number of experts today with some of these ideas. Um, but really, uh, we have a lot of public data here in Congress. We have also a lot of private data. And all of these large language models can be optimized or personalized or trained or trained a lot. And they can be trained on more data sets. And we have a lot of private data. You, know, you have constituent data, constituent mail data. You know, we can train models to better understand that. You know, the uh, private, private type model. Or, uh, for example, you have all this institutional history in your office, all these letters and numbers and vote recommendations. And you hear often uh, with staff turnover, we kind of lost the knowledge, not just of the institution, but my own office. Um, so theoretically, you know, we could train models with your office's data to help you say, hey, how should we vote on this thing? How should we, uh, what should we recommend your boss? And actually leverage the data from your own office's institution. So tons and tons of possibilities. This working group is all about experimenting, trying new things, and uncovering and discovering what the possibilities are. And here, uh, you know, again, the House Digital Services here at your service um, to help facilitate uh, you know, technology adoption like AI and anything else. So with that, I want to turn it over next to, I think, Lars this time. Um, to talk about some pretty exciting possibilities with these models. Thank you. I'm Lars, I'm policy technologist in Lincoln Network, and my presentation will just be going over some of the ways that you all can use AI in your offices, <coughs> along with some of the troubling downsides on the one hand of giving people access to these tools, all in a great place. So, yeah. So, Marcy talked about this a little bit earlier before the law came up, but the space is moving very quickly. Only a few years ago, <coughs> people thought that these models were just 
not very helpful, but nowadays people are working on and taking models that would normally just fit on large computers and getting them to fit on phones like Lambda and, and Microsoft, uh, Facebook's work, and making them even smaller and smaller. So it's soon going to be the case where you don't necessarily need a large data center to run these models. You'll simply just be able to get the weights on your phone, run it, and what type of implications that has when instead of going through a centralized service, everybody can just do this type of work on their own personal computers. And we mostly think in, about text generative models, but there's other models on the way as well. I just have some of the major players up. So we have the art generative models like Mini Journey and Stability and Stable Diffusion. But we also have the more traditional text models like ChatGPT, Google Card, and Bot Claude, Bing with their own bot. These have all their different issues. I don't know how many of you know this, but there's a case a month or two ago when Microsoft released their model with Bing where it responded to users in a very aggressive fashion, to put it lightly. <laughs> Whereas some like ChatGPT and Claude are designed to be less toxic, to use the language of these people who develop models. And the main implication of that is we're going to enter a point where, again earlier, but there's going to be so many open source models that we can't just depend on a single company to watermark these tools and hope for the best when trying to track if certain text or images or video is generated by AI because simply they can use an open source one that doesn't have those constraints. And we can see already, there's a lot of people working on this already. Like, it's not just a big five I listed. There's brigades of companies that, from just building wrappers around these schools to build corporate use cases to people developing their own models to do the bespoke cases. There's a whole thing in mind. And one of the bigger ones to think about is beyond, say, using text and search functionalities of LLMs. To be able to, for example, cross compare two bells and have to explain what the differences are. You can also, for example, use image models to generate standardized stock imagery instead of having to find your own, find your own elsewhere or voice. Like, this is a more speculative one, but we're already seeing people using voice models to make people say things that they, they didn't actually say. But there are probably positive sides to this, but that's an implication for a later time. But most interestingly is video, which is in state, sort of the early stages, like stable diffusion one day, so like literally just a year ago, where it's kind of bad looking. But soon we'll reach a point where you can get pretty good video auto-generated, and what happens with that? There's probably some implications for producing graphics, campaigns, what have you. But we do need to think about this quickly, and Ken and the Modernization Committee, even if the report didn't explicitly mention it, what events like these compared to other technologies, it's pretty great that Congress is moving on the ball to at least start thinking about these things, because especially with the next election cycle coming up, not to bring politics explicitly in the room, a lot of people are going to be using these tools for purposes good and bad, so it's better to think about them now versus think about them when a national controversy happens and everybody gets surprised when a tool was used for malicious purposes. <laughs> but for happier reasons, I'm just going to go through some basic examples of things that are good at. For example, it's actually better than Google Translate. We're actually translating text. So for example, if you're interested in the opinions of a foreign country looking for the reports, you can plug that into ChatGPT4 with a larger context window and get a pretty good translation. So it means we simply have more information to parse through. Another one, and this is a basic example of code, is that anybody is a coder now. So for example, what if your office wanted to generate graphics of data that are collected on a given policy issue? Well, I unfortunately don't have it on the slides, but you can actually use this type, use ChatGPT to ask it to generate code in various programming languages like Python, R, to generate code that will generate graphics with you with data sets if you provide them. 
for illustrations. I stole this from our office act, our work actually, but you can just use it to generate stock Im stock imagery instead of how to control the internet for non-copyrighted images. So if you have want to bring a special touch to your office and do something a bit more bespoke, you can do that. Given that everybody has a style guide, it's pretty easy with, for example, MIDI Journey or Stable Diffusion to plug in your style guides and have it generate art that fits your specifications. However, there are unfortunately trouble areas. <laughs> The one I'm thinking about that's not very speculative, that's already happening, is any tool that lets you generate a lot of text. It makes it very easy to flood any sort of communications that involve a lot of text. For example, said, submitting witness test, public witness testimony to the Appropriations Committee, or sending letters to members of Congress, or on the side of executive agencies, flooding public comments. Then, as a word of warning from the data perspective, especially with OpenAI, they use what you write in for training data. So you should absolutely not put anything confidential in there because it will be in a training data set and somebody might be able to find it. This actually happened to Samsung a few months ago with some staffers at Samsung the company put in proprietary information about the company within the chat, chat GPT, and then they got banned from doing that because it was able to get surplus from people who were writing prompts about Samsung for research. And then this has been covered a lot already, but it'll be more and more of a concern as people think about doing research and using them as research assistants, that these models are prone to hallucination because they're not really meant to get the truth. They're just generating what's most likely to pop up after a given word. And this can have really horrible consequences. There was a case, for example, where a, fe a professor had to deal with a fake harassment scandal because when somebody was typing in that professor's name in ChatGPT, it came up with a fake scandal based on actual work he did, like on sexual harassment scandals, like researching it. But it came up like he committed one. Like obviously we can ver verify that information just from Google, but what happens when you're rushed and you don't have time to double check the results, it can just lead to unfortunate incidents in research. So the second one is a bit more speculative, but unfortunately it's not really speculative anymore because it's actually happened. So the biggest one is there have been cases where AI voice models have been used to mimic individuals. For example, people have used this for fake kidnapping scandals. But what happens when, for example, somebody decides to impersonate a member of Congress for, let's say, anything from trying to fundraise, just to try to get access to staffers to do something they shouldn't be doing? Or what happens when somebody uses a tool called AutoGPT, which is basically lets you create multiple agents that run around and solve tasks? What if they do that to try to do like influence campaigns on the internet? Or on a high or on a high level, what happens when we adopt these tools and we simply don't know if we're talking to a human or a chatbot anymore, and nobody's really inclined to let you know if they're different or not? There's plenty of more. To, I could go into this, but my colleague Sam Hammond at Lincoln Network did a great job of listing all of these potential concerns. He's more of a pessimist than I, I am. I simply believe that we can actually solve these problems if we manage to transition through the internet. I'm surely we could deal with the rise of these models, which ultimately we're still in the week of making. And that's all. Hi everyone. Lars, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, so um, I'm supposed to be the, the Pollyanna uh, on this side of this, where I'm supposed to talk about the things that one can use with ChatGPT uh, or other AI uh, generative tools. Um, so uh, just glad to be seeing all of you. Um, so let's get started. So, um, you know, like any lazy person, I think my starting point for this presentation was to ask an AI what you should know about <laughs> what the AIs can do. Oh, let me, let me preface this. Don't read any of the text that I'm putting up here. You could read it if you want, but like 
it's it's not bullet points. It's it's for the purpose of demonstration, not explanation. The yellow that you're seeing are the prompt that I asked, and the white is the response that I got from the bot. I'm putting up the first response that I got, so you can see that I didn't uh, tweet it. Um, so, you know, these these type for the language on the language side, like these are really good at generating lots and lots of responsive stuff. Some of which is really good, and some of which is not so good. Um, the AI thinks that it can help draft legislation. I don't think that that's true at all. It is actually pretty good at generating reports. Um, um, I think it is like a really good assistant, right? Who comes up with a lot of good ideas, writes well-formed language that helps you do what you want, but you as a human actually need to go through it. But the warnings that it has, it has a bunch of good ones. It has no context or understanding of political or social nuances. That's definitely true. It can't tell what the reasoning is behind a thing, right? It's it's looking at sort of the, the, the context of the way words are used together, but there's not any thinking that's happening behind it. It doesn't understand uh, ethical considerations um, or moral implications. Hopefully that's the job of the staff or a member of Congress. Your mileage might vary. Um, and it doesn't talk about what artists are talking about, which is hallucinations. Um, I've, I've had it generate my biography, and I've gone to a number of different universities. That would have been, I would have been very excited to go to. <laughs> um, so just some use, so I'm going through use cases. So here's a use case. How many people have tried to create a clever acronym for a bill that they're working on? Yeah. Alright, well here's a pen that was generated in two seconds. Uh, oh, I'm playing with the concept of the debt ceiling. I'm not taking a position on it. I had to take all the different positions. My favorite one is the Verizon app, which is the last one. Halt, halting outdated restrictions on a zealous investment in our nation. <laughs> These are pretty good. Uh, debt free is also pretty good. I spent, I think, three hours coming up with a bill called the Merit Act, which is making every representative's integrity transparent. This is a lot faster than that. <laughs> um, um, all right, I hate writing tweets. So here's five tweets for and against the debt ceiling. Uh, it was done in two seconds. You can direct it uh, for what points you want to make or not make. Uh, it, it created a hashtag, so you can direct the hashtags that you want, but this is kind of nice, right? Um, often when you tweet, like you want to say the same thing multiple times but in slightly different ways, this allows you to iterate on that really quickly under whatever direction or position you want to take. I hate writing Dear Colleagues. So here's a doc, Dear Colleague, on one of the fake bills we came up with, the Death End Act. Ooh, I guess this is the right speech button in my voice. Um, a creative fake staffer, John Doe at john.doe at mail that has that go. I did not tell it the email address, so you even got part of the phone number right. Um, and just for entertainment, the congressman is Count de Monet. But this is a great, you know, this is a great first draft, and you can tell it to put other things in there for arguments you want to make or not make. You know, writing your pilot letter takes you an hour. Okay, well, this was two seconds, so you could uh, finish any of the be done and go on and do something else. Um, here's a statement on the floor three minutes. If this actually times out at three minutes. I forget what. I give it some like weird argument under that ceiling again. It's a pretty good speech, right? It's not a great speech, but I've seen better. This is better speech than a lot of what you see on uh, C-SPAN or the House, you know, or video camera. Uh, and it's a lot shorter than anything you see in the Senate, so that's good. Um, but that's that's really it's really helpful. And again, I didn't go into, but you can give instructions of what points to make in which order and how you want to do this. So it can be it's really malleable. Um, I used to write CRS reports. CRS reports are great, but they're like book stuff, right? I was, I was an attorney there, like they're really long. So this summary here that uh, is, is nice, but I didn't want to read that. So I went to my website, everycrsreport.com, and I grabbed the summary. I said, give me the bullet points. Bullet points are spot on. They're accurate, surprisingly. And uh, they pull out things that you would actually really want to know from this. So these are some of the uses, right? Summary, generation, um, iteration, well-formed, good language, so that like you have a lot of things that so you can have if you have an intern or, or your staff or LC or whatever you can get to where you want to go really quickly. I find that for me it's a lot easier to edit than it is to write. Um, so let's let's go to the other side. So this is playing with words. This is answering questions. So I'm an attorney by training. I don't know where to code. At least not very well. If I try to create this regex, which is an extraction formula, it would have taken me like an hour or two, and it probably would have screwed it up a while. I wanted to figure out how to extract a date from a column of information with a bunch of words around it. So I said, hey, would you write the formula for me? And I'm using it now. It's great. It worked perfectly. 
Um, this is a simple version. So you can, so if you're trying to manipulate sheets, you know, like Google Sheets, Microsoft Excel, things like that, and you're trying to manipulate the information in there to extract it, it will simply solve it for you, so you don't need to watch the 10 minute YouTube videos that explain how to do those things. But more interestingly, um, it's really good with um, um, uh, playing with uh, spreadsheet data in sort of a different way. So I stole this from a YouTube video because I was too lazy to make my own. Um, so the first two columns are customer name and feedback. We can imagine it's a constituent name and it's constituent communication. And what it can do is it can extract uh, the customer name. You say, give me the first, the first name of the customer email. You write it in plain language. So this is nothing like, go find the at sign, look at what's before the at sign, and make sure you truncate and all this other stuff that nobody wants to know. So it did that in a second. And then it created a little training data about, is this a positive feedback or negative feedback? So the first two are training. And then going down, it looks at these other examples and looks at the two examples like, oh, I can easily categorize this as positive or negative. So you've got a town hall and you've got 100 you know, things that email responses from that or um, uh, you're writing thank you notes for the boss. I used to hate writing the thank you notes. And when I did it, it was like the typewriter wasn't able to appear. It really sucked. Um, <laughs> but but like you, you can you can do this to summarize. Imagine you're an appropriator, right? And you've got um, all the appropriations requests from constituents. You're in the appropriations command. You get it from the appropriations command. You can summarize the subject matter. You can go through um, I don't know the committee report and pull out all the points in the committee report. That are the policy positions and turn them into bullet points. Um, you can do a lot of really interesting stuff. So the point here is you can take unstructured data, which is text, and you can turn it into semi-structured or fully structured data. And you don't have to actually know what you're doing to do it, which is great for people like me who don't have to do that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, again, lazy. So I said, okay, well, you know, what's the big term picture changes with respect to Congress and AI? And some of the responses here were edifying. Uh, improving speed and efficiency in analyzing large data sets, I think that's probably true. Uh, accuracy in defending patterns and trends in legislative history, also probably true. Predicting legislative outcomes, probably not, but you don't need AI to do that either. There are, so one of the points worth making here is that not everything is AI, right? There are a lot of things that have been built in the House and built in the Senate and elsewhere that don't rely on this technology that were great. The Compared to Truth Project is a good example of this. GovTrack is a great prediction tool for legislation. You don't have to use this for everything. This is not a solve all the stuff kind of tool, but it is good for a number of use cases. Underlying a lot of this is making sure that legislative information is available as data, if you can, as structured data, as if you can, or certainly just available as like information, like picture PDFs, like that, right? You want to have something that is actually more useful. Um, I think the other stuff in here, like radio collaboration across party lines and things like that, clearly here the AI is hallucinating. Um, <laughs> but I think there's a lot that's coming that will be coming fairly quickly. We've seen these boom and bust cycles for a while uh, with respect to technology. Uh, the house is actually a lot farther ahead of the cycle than what we've seen in the past, which is really kind of good. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, I put some robots in here because I thought it would be fun. Oh, <laughs> also because it's an illustration of other uses of AI. So if you want to take the pictures of people out from a messy image, you can do that type of entity extraction. That's where I pulled this from. Um, in violation of copyright, but I'm sure none of you have heard So that's it. Um, who, you're next again. All right. Thank you all. I have four tough acts to follow, and I'm going to be repeating a little bit of what my colleagues have gone through. But in a different use case, um, hey everyone, I'm Ann Beaker. I am a former district staffer and former caseworker. So today, what I really want to zoom in on is specific uses of AI in some of these tools for district staff and for casework. I realize we probably don't have a lot of people in the room who do this work in your day to day. But part of my challenge for you today is to think about how are you going to work with your district colleagues. Um, they're going to be working on these tools as well. There's huge implications for what these can do for casework for district staff. Um, so I hope that this will be an ongoing conversation between y'all, your district, your state staff. Um, there's a lot of uh, ways to collaborate there. So uh, first of all, I'm going to walk through some cool options. Some of these are things that we can do right now, some of which I hope are integrated one day directly into the CRMs. Uh, where folks are doing this casework. Uh, 
let me caveat, and my colleagues have said this already, but let me just make it absolutely as clear as I possibly can. Casework information is some of the most sensitive information that your member has. Um, this is really, really deeply identifiable constituent data. This is medical records, VA records, tax records. Please, 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 for the love of God, don't put this into chat GPT. Uh, let me put that out there right away. But fun stuff. Okay. Um, Daniel showed us how uh, chat GPT can be used for translation and summary. This is a huge part of what caseworkers handle. And again, let me also say from Daniel that uh, text up here is for illustration purposes. Please don't feel like you have to swing and read this. Um, but a lot of what casework teams handle is gigantic, ugly agency letters. These, you know, 45 pages page summaries of what happened in this VA decision that went to the Board of Veterans Appeals. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I got a call from constituents saying, I don't understand this letter. Can you help me? That was the entire casework task. Can you read this letter and help me out? Um, so this is a huge thing that ChatGPT and these models can do. Take something like this, turn it into bullet points to help me prep for a call. If I get this letter, I want a summary so that I can get on the phone to that constituent faster and give them that news. Or to turn it into a summary that I can include in a form letter for that constituent. Hey, we got this letter from the VA. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to pull out of it. Don't be intimidated by this masculine of text. Um, and then form letters and scalable process building. I had a fascinating conversation with a caseworker in Washington State the other day um, who uh, started as a new caseworker in a fairly new office. There was one caseworker. Their traditional caseload was about 40 cases. But she had come from a center office where they had thousands of cases. And so she knew a lot about process building. She took the time when she came in to build out the form letter situation. So when the pandemic hit, that office was able to scale really, really quickly on the casework. That one single caseworker went from handling 40 cases to 150 cases with no interruptions in service because they had their process, their form letters built out. This makes that accessible to every office without knowing you have to build your form letters, making it easier to build your form letters and get them in your CRM, or one day eliminating the need for them altogether. You don't need a form letter if you can get ChatGPT to write that letter to the constituent for you, write that initial inquiry to, uh, to the agency for you instead. So that makes it faster, and it also leads to a more consistent and more helpful constituent experience, which is really exciting. And then casework data. Um, if I've worked with any of you before, you've heard me talk about casework data. This is the thing that I'm so excited about. So your congressional, your case, your congressional caseworkers are getting fascinating data from your constituents about where are the pain points for federal agencies, where are programs not being implemented the way Congress intended. That data can be really tough to get back out of those CRMs. Um, some offices are really set up well to get good data and their casework and be able to pull it quickly. And if you're on a legislative team, you may have asked your casework team, hey, we've got some, we've got a hearing coming up from the Postal Service. Do we have any cases uh, involving the post office recently that my boss can use uh, in hearing prep? Um, that can be really tough. One of the things that we can do with this is actually be able to pull that casework data a lot more easily, and like some of my colleagues have mentioned, without needing to know how to code, without needing to know how to get into that data uh, and figure it out as a programmer. This is just a really good example from someone doing this uh, with San Francisco data. But that means that, ostensibly, one day, a caseworker would be able to ask, hey, show me cases that we worked in the last six months for veterans that weren't VA cases. What other issues are veterans handling? Um, or be able to more easily pull uh, location data for cases. It's some really interesting stuff. So that could happen there. And one day, let me say, this is my vision. I don't expect to see this in CRMs anytime soon. What I would love to see is for this to enable eliminating any kind of manual data entry for casework. Um, if I upload an SSDI appeal form into my CRM for a case, it would be awesome if that CRM would automatically tag that case as an SSDI case. So then later I can go back and pull, hey, I need to see all of my SSDI cases instead of me having to tell the CRM that that's what this case is for. So I'm really excited there. Okay, um, I'm going to pull. I am going to talk about some of the things that scare me as a former caseworker for what this, what this might, uh, what this might open up. So, um, if y'all have been here for a few years, if you have been around uh, during the pandemic, during the Afghanistan withdrawal, you've already seen a little bit of how this can work. Um, moments of incredibly high casework demand. Norm the staff that are normally constituent are normally not constituent facing have to get pulled into constituent facing stuff when there are just thousands and thousands of really urgent cases coming in in many offices. Uh, handled this, um, it frankly surprises me that this has not already been weaponized. So imagine you have your 2,000 Afghanistan withdrawal cases coming in. If you couldn't tell which thousand of those were real cases and which thousand of them were generated by a malicious actor, 
that's a huge amount of your office's capacity that you're going to be spending chasing down fake cases. Um, and again, it's amazing how realistic some of these look. So they're just pulling actors being able to decide how are they going to move around congressional capacity. Is it still in DC where it should be? Do we have to move everything there? I think really kind of, kind of scares me that health offices are thinking about good ways to verify personhood and verify identity. Um, this also scares me. So again, when I was a caseworker, I was surprised to occasionally get constituents asking me to participate or to be an accomplice as they were committing fraud. Blew my mind. People asked. Um, but what's scary is that offices can actually be pulled into this more often. So a case that I had was um, a constituent who should have gotten a massive retroactive check from Social Security or people been going on for years and years. It was like a thirty forty forty thousand dollar check. It got sent to the wrong address. And so the casework asked, can you help me work at Social Security and the Treasury to get this check reissued and sent to my correct address? Looking back at my own process, there was never a checkpoint when I verified that constituent's identity. That mean, that could happen to other offices. Um, and frankly I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often now, especially as my some of my colleagues were talking about the ability to voice phone a person, so even for existing cases, saying, you know, you've worked with me before, there's no way that I would be able to tell that that's these or he's not that constituent. So that's some, um, yeah, that's something that's really scary. I don't need to be up here doing room, but I think offices should be giving some giving some thought to how they're going to handle some of these worst case scenarios. So then on that note, let me just uh, pause for a second for how can offices prepare. Um, Again, yeah, I said my challenge to you is working with your caseworkers, working with your district staff to be ready for this. I think there are some good ways to start getting ready. Um, first of all, is just having these conversations, letting your team know that this is a possibility. The first best tool you have for kind of spotting these impersonations is your gut instinct. Um, so, kind of telling caseworkers, hey, this is a possibility. You need to be ready for this. Trust that instinct. This might be happening. So, just keep that spidey sense up, up and running. And then, thinking through a worst case scenario at collaboratively with your teams. How are you going to handle it if some of these worst case scenarios start happening? Do you have to shift to mobile office hours? Do you have to shift to an in person intake component? Are you checking IDs? How are you checking IDs? Um, I think this isn't something that all offices have really put a lot of thought into, and I think it's going to be really important. And then the clear and consistent messaging. If you do have to shift your casework intake, making sure your constituents still know how to reach you is really important. And then also giving constituents info. Um, this stuff is hard to understand. It's really exciting. There's a lot of coverage on it. Um, and I think there are going to be a lot of constituents taking in by some scams. There's going to be a lot of constituents reaching out to your offices as trusted voices to figure out, how is this going to impact my life? Um, we're already seeing some uh, interesting, exciting uh, opportunities, services out there built on some of these platforms uh, to help you, that claim to help constituents navigate the law, navigate bureaucracy, navigate federal agencies. Um, I, would, I would not be surprised if officers start coming, your constituents start coming to you and saying, is this legit? Or, I hope this doesn't happen, I use one of these services and now my appeal's been mishandled, can you help me un-mess it up? Um, so being ready to talk to your comms team about how are you going to communicate this in your districts, in your states. I would be remiss if I didn't use my opportunity up here to say that we have some of these conversations with caseworkers as part of our navigator program. So please feel free to send your staff my way uh, for some of these conversations. We'd love to keep the conversation going about how are we, how is casework going to change uh, into the future. Thank you all so much. Thank you to all the speakers. If you can have all of the speakers come and just grab a chair and pull it up here, and we'll just do a very quick Q and A. Uh, I think we'll probably run ten minutes over, so uh, feel free to kind of resettle while we shift around a bit. I guess you have a mic. Who's got a question? Do you have a lot of examples where people summarize the big debts document, like the CRS report or the letter from the federal agency? If we are just telling the, the, the AI model to summarize that report, do we still need to be concerned about it hallucinating? Because then what's What's the purpose of it? Like, if it's just telling us it to look at one thing, can we trust that it's actually pulling from the one thing? So, I, I don't know the answer to that question. My experience has been that if, it, if you're giving it a source document, it may missummarize it, like it may make mistakes, but it's not going to 
but my, I haven't seen it pulling from elsewhere. So it's it's usually pulling, you know. But I'm using, I used uh, Chat GPT and Bard to to try to, you know. So your miles will vary. Um, but if you have uh, something, you know, something that's more locally done, like I, I, it seems that it, it seems that it's fine. Again, none of these things you should trust as they are. You should always look it over and make sure that makes sense. Maybe is Lars still here? Is Lars? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. So, so so far it seems to be fine, but just be like everything. Be cautious. Yeah. I can share that Bloomberg and Morgan Stanley's domain-specific training models saw significant reduction in hallucinations just because it's this bounded set that they're working through. So there may be errors, but they're not hallucinating things that didn't happen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk today. And my question for the house digital service. Um, I know you guys talk about working with um, congressional offices. So my question is, how can we leverage our data in Fireside and um, on IQ and use it to find existing models like QBT or BERT um, without like definitely providing or leaking confidential information? Yeah, that's awesome. Actually, you know, there's something in our backlog. We'd love to. to, to Pull you into it. We're really interested in aggregating data out of all CRMs, anonymizing the constituent information, and using all of that in aggregate to provide analysis, whether it's sentiment or not, constituent letter sentiment or trends on casework. So that's actually right at the top of our backlog. So we can do it more effectively. Well, then, can I just ask that the CRMs themselves may be uh, adding in some of these tools in the future? And also, you know, Microsoft is one of the the innovators there, so the, the uh, offices that are using Microsoft, there may, there may be an opportunity to have kind of close consideration of data that is shared within the office uh, system or the Microsoft system. But we, we will continue with some of these conversations in later um, uh, events as we get more information about how it's actually going to work. Other questions? Yes? Can you explain again about the structured data in the spreadsheets? How uh, Chad uh, or how this can be used to make sense of, of that data. I thought it was really awesome. I sort of went to my blog, maybe fell down a bit. Uh, so it'd be good to see a lot of structured data because I saw the unstructured data and being able to do the sentiment analysis. That's like a really interesting use case. Um, and so just the kind of, I, I, I had not said, of course, I considered paragraphs and writing. Bullet points, but I don't consider you use that spreadsheet and how you can actually get data. Can we go back one slide? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, or what did you have? Oh, I thought it was just, it was it was just one thing. slide with spreadsheets or was it two? There's, go to the next one, please. Yeah, it's this one. I think, I think it's this one. Is that one? Okay. Yeah, and, and there, there was actually a more awesome one that I wanted to use, but it was a two minute runtime. So I, I, didn't, I didn't use it. So uh, do you want to know like, how to do it or do you want to know like, what it can do? Or both. Let me make it, let me make a suggestion, which is Daniel. Will you either record a video or write out a blog post that you link to in next week's first branch forecast? No, because, <laughs> <laughs> because it comes up Monday morning and was it like one o'clock on Friday? Okay, the next but, week. But, 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 but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can link to. So I actually I found the bird. Someone was playing with this with Jack, Chat GPT, the, the version three. Version. So it's. Uh, let me talk just for thirty seconds about what it can do, and then I'll talk like how you do it. Okay. So. What blew my mind originally was like someone had put in like all just their address information, and it was like the whole thing is like you know thirteen thirty three Mockingbird Lane whatever it was right and um, you, they, you could say like pull out the city, pull out the state, in like in the next field and basically prompt it like saying go look at this other column and find the state and put it in the two. And it does it right, so it's connect. You can connect to. There's a number of services that let you connect to uh, the underlying AIs that basically call them, but your directions are in English, so you're not writing some convoluted code. You're saying, "Oh, just you know, hey, ChatGPT, would you please give me the state from this other from this other thing?" And it will it will put into that field. If you got a thousand rows, you can just drag it down, and you're done. Which, if you want to ever dealt with like unstructured address data, that sucks. Right, that's miserable to do. But but more interesting to me, uh, although that saves a ton of time, was you can look at um, uh, what is this person purchasing? Oh, let's do it in the congressional. Uh, what is this person writing about? 
right? You know, what, what subject matter, what issue? And you can either do some training if there's a limited number of issues. Um, so you can do like the first five rows, like, oh, this person's writing about agriculture, this person's writing about And once you've got the training set, you can say, hey, look at this examples that I gave you and classify everything below this based upon what I've done. And it does that also in a second. So if you've got a thousand letters, right, and, and, and they're represented basically in the fields, you can actually say this is what each of these letters are about, for example. And that's really useful. And the way it works is there's different page services that one can do. Um, I, I do it in Google Sheets, so for Google Sheets you can add a, um, I can't think of the word, like 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 an outside, an outside tool. Plugin. 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 Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a specific word, I can't remember the word, it doesn't matter. Um. Add-on, thank you, that is in fact the word. Um, you, can add, you can add the add-on, thank you Marcy and Ari, um, and uh, that allows you to call, you type equal chat GPT and then you put a bracket and then you say, hey, would you go look at this thing and find this other stuff for me and put it in there? And you can write it, you can say it as um, badly as I just said it now, and it will do that. And that's really, really phenomenal if you've got lots and lots of information that you're trying to do. And it's it's so simple that even an attorney like me can do it. So like, And, and I'm going to add that there's probably a CAO, a review asterisk on those add-ons. <laughs> well, are, are you looking at that? Yeah. Yeah, that's another question, perhaps digital and perhaps CAO. Yeah, you know, just any updates on Microsoft Copilot, whether that looks like it's done? Uh, you know, we're, um, I don't have a specific update on that other than I know that that's in the pipeline of delivery into the Gov Cloud, and that all kind of comes to us a little later than the commercial sector. Um, and likewise, that will probably have to go through some new, new processes. But uh, there is a, um, if, if Connect afterwards. There is a, a group that I can get a more specific update on for that. But, yeah. um, I might have missed this, but I just wanted to know um, how folks can reach out for more information about that working group if you our office want to participate or just staying up to date from the feedback that they give. Absolutely. So our House Digital website, House Digital Service website is digitalservice.house.gov. And uh, it's slash AI is the type specific landing page, but there's a couple buttons all over to sign up to stay updated or to join the advisory groups. Quick question Is your website uh, accessible to the Senate and the Sport offices and agencies as well, or is it only for the House? It is an internal website. It may be available to senators, but likely, but definitely not, it's definitely not external. Other than but like the CBO or, or a library be able to do that as well? I think so, yes. Because I think it's shared on our own internal uh, IP. Okay. Okay. Um, so you, for example, in the spreadsheet, right, and where it's pulling down a topic of, uh, you know, what does this mean? Like, what was this written about getting a topic if I give it gun violence, immigration, climate, right, pick from these or non compliant? Is there a way? And this is good generally for these tools to understand its confidence level in what it's providing you, right? Like I'm 70% confident that what I just read, if I'm chat GPT, what I just read is that. Um, or, and even when you're right, summarizing a document, I'm 90% confident that this is an accurate summary. Yeah, I would say you know, yes. So this this chat GPT large language model, this is kind of all derived from natural language processing. And, and all of those algorithms have a confidence index. Um, it's obscure, it's hidden, it's not in the parent, it's not delivering to you through the chat GPT interface. Uh, but if you look at other like private models or customized models, uh, that can be exposed. We just add sort of one more thing on top of that, which is that yeah, again, the universe of internet resources, you can also use multiple things to check each other. So you can have Bard look at it and chat you can see look at it. So like not only do you have a confidence index, but you also can like, you know, if different things are arriving at the same results using different mechanisms, that may make you more comfortable in the results that it's, that it's uh, choosing as well. Any other questions? Hi. Are these slides going to be available to us like in the future going forward or next week? Absolutely not. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, and we'll some videos too. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and if Marcy, if it's okay with Marcy, like I'll also include in the first minute forecast newsletter, but it will also go out. I'm, I'm sure from, but it will also go out. I'm sure. Sorry, from uh, from Marcy for everyone in this group. Yes. And please sign up for the AI working group with 
haven't heard about the new license, so that means we can get one. Aww. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. We've uh, started to distribute licenses, um, and we're acquiring them. Okay. Can we buy one from our MRA? Yes. Okay. The house can. Like a, a member, house, member, house, house member offices. Right, yeah. Yes. Sam may be a different story. Uh, so, um, in the near term, what should Congress institutionally be doing to help with adoption or debate concerning adoption uh, of these tools? Well, our work group is exactly that to experiment with these tools, share knowledge amongst <laughs> ourselves so we can determine hey, this, is, this is a dump, this is a do, this is an area we can do further development. So, also, Congress to make sure that it adequately funds the entities that are doing this type of work so that they can do this, uh, give them the ability to have, have appropriate sandboxes to do this work, make sure that there is collaboration across the support offices, the support agencies, the House and the Senate, and to the extent possible and appropriate to work with outside groups as well. There's a lot of, so there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, but it needs to make sure there's institutional support for it and enough technologists and developers and other folks to sort of look through the issues. I can't say something else. I can't say something. Good, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go forward, but I know the digital service website can't be accessed by some of the staff right now, practically. It's only on the house with kind of any public version, but we have been trying to post things on LinkedIn so you can search for us there uh, to get a lot of paid info or find me after um, that I can connect you with any of our resources. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap? Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is, a, is a pro license safer or more closed, or is it just like giving me the time to use it? Uh, yeah, I think you're just getting dedicated resources. Okay. You can request, you can email ChatGPT, and you can request that your information not be put into their testing oh. or something, or in the bank of their reference. You have to go through their API, but you can do it. Okay. Do you want me to say that? I'll say that for the point. So um, you can email chat to you about this for the Wikipedia, but uh, to ask that your information not be used in their training set. And I know that other ones, I think uh, Mid Journey also, if you buy a pro version, you can also make sure that no one else can see the results of what you're creating. Might be great to request that they do that for anything coming from the professional IP issues. Yes. 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 Any other questions before we wrap? Sorry, just a clarification. Yes. Question. That's so they can not keep your data. Is that what you're saying? So they can't use what you're putting in as your query to print as to become part of the corpus that the model is training on that answers other people. Understood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Folks, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Obviously, we still have a lot of questions. So much more to come. Thank you for coming today. Uh, have a good rest of your, your awesome weekend. <laughs>